I said in my video on war games that mostly what draws me to any type of game playing, particularly war games, but any type of game playing is narrative and the ways that games allow construction of narrative. And as such, I wanted to talk a little bit about solo RPG play. I've done one video, well, two videos really that touch on this using the James Bond RPG system, but it's a little challenging to do a video, or it has been challenging for me to do a video about this. I've tried and discarded some of them and um, ended up with this. So first, a word of warning. Um, this is here it is. This is the visual for the video. So if that's a turn off, if a three ring binder is a turn off, I mentioned a three ring binder in my video on Voyage of the BSM Pandora and somebody made the comment appreciating that I mentioned it early on so they could click away. So I'm doing that here again because we're going to be featuring this three ring bond binder to the extent that we're featuring anything here. And I'm going to be talking about, well, I'll just show you the credits here. I'm going to be talking about a little bit about the fantasy trip and how I use some of the rule sets that go with this RPG to create a story to play through one of the um, uh, existing, I think they're called micro quests or adventures that come that, that were published alongside it or around the time of it to create a an a solo RPG experience that also is mostly based on an existing pre-programmed adventure and how that this can be done in a I think a relatively easy way because part of the challenge for me when I look at RPG solo RPG systems now to try to do something that I haven't played before is it just it seems like putting together a whole bunch of stuff and a big uphill climb and for me using the rules that exist uh, let me just show you here so what we've got so the fantasy trip um, was a solo RPG here we go let's look at my little the description here, um, the fantasy trip is killing monsters, finding treasure, braving danger, joining quests, conjuring magic, and exploring the unknown. So the In the Labyrinth system is um, really was basically for the GM, and it is something that contains explanations that would be for the person running the game, as well as um, selections that you can use as if I as I use it to enhance um, the rules that you may be using to play your adventure. So wizard here are the magic rules. I've got, um, well that's actually the reference pages. Wizard and advanced wizard were published. So here are the, um, here's the, uh, this is the advanced, well I think this is actually the basic. When I usually play, Wizard are the magic rules, Melee are the combat rules. There were, was Advanced uh, Wizard and Advanced Melee also. I don't ever use the Advanced Melee because the uh, combat is in Melee is sufficient enough for me. I don't need the add-ons that come with the Advanced Melee, such as like where you're doing the hit on the body or whatever. Whereas with Wizard, I'm much more interested in magic. And when I run parties of adventures, I usually run three Wizards and two Fighters. And I like the enhanced spells that come with Wizards, and with Wizard rules. And also in um, the games that I'm running, I will branch out a little bit from the existing adventure to um, have additional encounters and additional things that may happen in hexes that are not part of the pre-programmed adventure, for example. So what we're looking at here is the map for Treasure of the Silver Dragon. And Treasure of the Silver Dragon was a module that was released that actually offered players the chance to win $10,000, like a real amount of $10,000. And I believe that somebody did, using the clues that were in this pre-programmed adventure, locate the actual $10,000 or, well, it was actually a little um, figurine, I think, that needed to be turned into metagaming to get the $10,000. And I believe that actually happened. What this is, is a pre-programmed adventure that has within it um, the capacity to use additional rule sets 
such as from Wizard and Melee, and in my case, also bringing in In the Labyrinth to create a party of adventurers to wander through the map. And basically what you need to ultimately do, I don't know how, it's pretty small how effectively you can see it is, there are only a few numbered hexes and they are here. Once you reach them, now you're not just simply walking in because you will have some encounters as we'll see, but once you reach these hexes, then you get into the um, actual pre-programmed paragraphs that come. Now, this video is going to be spoiler free as the description says, so I'm not going to go into detail about those, but in general terms, I will say that what happens is when you get to one of these numbered hexes, for example, it will describe a situation where you may be in a town or you may be in a castle or you may be encountering and observing some other people or dwarves or creatures that live in this land, and then you're given some choices as to how you will interact with them, if you'll interact with them. And then from there, it branches out into a pre, uh, pre-programmed pre adventure where you, if you're choosing this, then you go to that paragraph, etc. Now, within this, it will tell you at certain times, you may basically step off the uh, on-ramp into an unnumbered hex. There are in the unnumbered hexes uh, capacity to have encounters that are also described in this module where you are rolling a d10 and depending on what terrain feature you're standing on, so this plane is the savanna, for example, if you roll a certain number that matches up with a savanna number, you would then have an encounter and then there's a short list of who you would be encountering and contained within the uh, instructions or the module are the values for the creatures that you will be encountering. In the way that I play it, to add in a little something extra, I am actually referencing my copy of In the Labyrinth where I have taken the um, list of the flora and the fauna and numbered them. So I'm rolling actually percentile die to come up with a number and then based on that roll, for example, if I rolled a 41, I would be encountering these zombies in the location. This works pretty well with the exception of um, what are called wetland hexes on the map or water hexes uh, or water creatures in here. I have to keep a separate list of the water creatures because as fantastic as this whole thing is, it does really stretch the imagination or at least for me to see like, for example, a, uh, you know, a big octopus popping up in the middle of a savanna. I mean, that's just not going to happen. So I do have a separate role that I've created if I am in a water hex or a wetland hex and I want to en encounter something that would potentially be living there. Or for example, this water elemental, you can see I have the, um, the two numbers here. So the water elemental can come up as a 39 anywhere and also within the water hex table, it is a six to um, pull in if it is, um, if you roll a six and you're on a wetland or a water hex. You don't need this, but I find that it adds a little variability and it also enables me to branch out as I like to, to create a little bit more of the story that I put into my own head as I'm playing this. So here are the, um, here's the melee rules and the credits for them that I want to be sure that I show you. It's described as the basic tactical combat system for metagaming's the fantasy trip role-playing game. Let's see, what else can I tell you about? What's interesting here too is the um, description of how this is intended to be played is both, it can be played both as a uh, two-person game or as solitaire play. There aren't solitaire rules per se, but it is a pre-programmed paragraph system to create the narrative. And they give you some suggestions of what to do. Um, let's see, page six, what to do um, to do your solitaire play. And basically um, it is explaining that you are um, having your Wizards avoid being engaged in direct combat so they can use their magic. What will happen if an opponent is downed or injured in some way? 
when an opponent has a choice as to who he will engage, what you can do, basically rolling a d6. You know, I, I tend to um, just see what would be the most advantageous to do. Um, and then it says, you know, when in doubt about any action, give them a 50-50 chance. What to do if you are encountering an illusion, which is something that can be cast either by you or by the other side. So there's a little bit of... Um, obviously just management of the other side. And if you are encountering, say, a group of hobgoblins or something, and there are six of them figuring out who is going to be in a position to move and engage with which member of your party. I take notes along the way in terms of where I end up in the hexes and what is happening here. I use the, I use other maps I have, other hex maps. The one that I think works the best for um, play up close, when, that is to say when you're having encounters in combat, is uh, from the Beast Lord, the tactical map from the Beast Lord that I have. I don't have it out here right now, but I set up my figurines on that, and I'm not really, I'm not really using anything fancy at all. I'm using, this fellow's been in my life for a long time, Mr. Peabody, and um, some figurines that I have from my kids. My little sub story here, um, these are my fighters, the dogs are the fighters, cat of course, wizard. The um, sub story that I have going on, or the, the I shouldn't say the sub story really, actually it's a meta story, is that my party is made up, in this case it was made up of the three wizards. One is elderly, so he knows a lot of spells, but he doesn't have a lot of strength. And in this game, I'm not going over the rules here because they are um, easily digested, I think, by anybody uh, who would be interested in it. But I'll say that uh, in this case, the strength that you have is ne necessary to cast spells. So he knows a lot of spells, but he doesn't have a lot of strength to cast them. And the party is partially, in addition to the pre-programmed adventure, trying to get this wizard to a particular space so he can gain some more life points from somebody that is there. And this is something that I play out on the side in addition to the pre-programmed adventure. So it gives a little additional story. And, you know, the, the, point, of, the point of all of this is that the use of the in the labyrinth material with the wizard and the melee rules and this pre-programmed adventure and there are a couple of them there's um i think the first one was death test that is a more traditional dungeon crawl um interior kind of um pre-programmed adventure there was death test 2 there was another one that followed um the silver dragon called Treasure of the Unicorn Gold that uh, followed. The putting together what is available to you within the labyrinth, where you can create some of your own story and the pre programmed adventure, allows for, for me, for a solo RPG experience without having to master and read and purchase you know, 500, 700, 1,000 pages of complicated rules. This is a much simpler system. The character creation is um, pretty basic. You have basically for the wizards three values that are allocated on a point system, and they are dexterity, intelligence, and strength. And for the fighters, you are simply dealing with dexterity and strength. And uh, upon that, it's not necessarily a rich character development, although In the Labyrinth gives you the option of creating all sorts of different classes of characters with occupations and personalities and characteristics and things like that that I'm not using, but that is there. Um, there is enough to invest in the characters and to use this system as a way of storytelling that I think RPG is notable for, for offering. It is um, interactive in the sense that you are telling the story yourself. And the simplicity of the design, I think, is what allows for more of the story to unfold. Um, you're working on a semi-determined path, uh, completely determined if you're just following the pre-programmed adventure, but in my case, semi-determined because I'm mostly following that. But when I'm stepping out of 
the paragraph story. And then I can continue along with the, my own quest that I'm running. The only other thing that I'm using is the fate chart and the chaos scale from the mythic emulator. And this helps answer questions based on the probability of something happening, which in turn is tied to how chaotic a state it is. So the idea is that you're starting in a chaotic ranking of five, and this will go up or down depending on your success or failure at certain things, like for example, combat or completing a quest. And then whether you're high or low on chaos is going to impact the uh, percentage of something happening if it is, for example, very unlikely or if it is very likely. So you can use this in a very simple way to ask questions of the scenario such as, would this creature continue to fight? Now, those are covered in the rules, but you can also handle it this way if you want something that's more of an RPG aspect. Or if you're going off on your own a little bit as I am and saying, for example, sending your party out into an unnumbered hex to do something there, you can follow along your own story and say, would in this case, you know, they choose to do this thing and answer the question that way and then have them doing that thing. So it's a little bit integrated. It takes a little bit of work in your mind. But again, that's, that's the essence of what running a solo RPG is, I think, um, that you are, you have trying to give yourself imperfect information, but you're in charge of the information also. And that's just how the story needs to progress. And it is what makes this type of narrative experience unique, because it is dynamically generated, but you're also the one generating it. So it's easier for me to imagine a world in a sense that is created this way through a game than having a game you know, with a board where everything is drawn out and it's a static system, even if there are dynamic things that change like cards or even your, your player powers, it still becomes very much about what is created physically by the game state. Here, this is a work of imagination and it is a story that you create in your head. It's not for everybody and um, it's really, you know, again, three ring binder city. But I find that despite the age of this system, the simplicity of it, it is still robust enough to allow me to create a different type of story as I go through. And then there is there are the existing pre-programmed adventures if you want that foundational structure and architecture there. They're pretty much only good for a one-time run through, you know, unless your memory is so poor. Um, even if you don't necessarily get to every numbered paragraph, the story as it unfolds is only going to happen one time. So there's that. But there are a bunch of them out there. And um, I just finished playing up the Silver Dragon one and it was really enjoyable and a type of storytelling that really can't be duplicated as I as I see it in any other medium. Thanks for watching.